Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Agostino Zingo Show, episode number 79, with me, your host, Agostino. What's up? What's going on? Long time no see no here. How you been, man? Ah! I've seen better days. I've seen better weeks. I've seen better months. I think I'm gonna go sober. Oh, it's been an absolutely barnstorming couple of weeks for the old um, A-G-O-S-T-I-N-H-O. And if you're wondering what that spells, it spells my name. <laughs> Clever, isn't it? But yeah, it's been a fucking barnstormer, man. It's been a barnstormer. It's been um, it's been crazy to say the least. I've had one of those weeks where you start to contemplate your life choices, where you start to um, spec out the next year, two years, three years, four years, five years, and you start to realize, you know what? If I go at this same kind of pace, right, for the next year, where will I be, really? And it probably won't be the place that I want to be. So, <laughs> with that being said, I've made some lastminute.com changes. <clears throat> and seeing as it's July anyway, it's always a good time to, you know, you know make big changes. You know, it's next, next, no, it's the next month. You want to, you want to, you, you want to, you want to freshen things up a little bit. And that's what I'm doing at the moment. I'm freshening things up a little bit because, um, I can't carry on like this, man. I just can't, man. I can't carry on like this. So yeah, um, wow, it's been a crazy, it's been a crazy week. Uh, we had our staff party on the sat, uh, no, on the Friday, that just passed, which was fucking amazing. Um, company parties are always a bit weird, aren't they? Right. Um, usually because, especially if you're working in a company where you don't necessarily get to meet everyone, right? Um, it's a bit strange to meet people. It's the best way to meet people in that kind of environment when you don't necessarily talk to them during the whole week or we don't talk to them during the year or a month, whatever it may be. But um, I'm fortunate enough to work in a company where, for the most part, everyone seems to get along. It's we're not like over 200 people, so it's not it's not that um, you don't lose people in that regard. We're all kind of spread out across one floor, even though we have different rooms. So you get to meet people all the time. We kind of have this one big kitchen that everyone goes to to get uh, little snacks and shit. So you bump into people. We usually have a weekly drinking session. So there's there's things surrounded in a culture, there's things embedded in the culture of the company that allow us to kind of communicate with each other. So it wasn't as awkward as my other summer parties or Christmas parties have been. Because I've worked in other places where the Christmas party was weird because you didn't get to meet anyone uh, during your regular working week. So when you did get to meet them, they were highly inebriated on all sorts of drugs um, or just hype. You know what I mean? Like, you know, the kind of people that you work with sometimes who don't necessarily go out. So when they have a company meet, when they have a company party that's fully comped, uh, where they cover all the drinks, where they cover all the food, you can, you you can't be blamed for going a bit nuts. You can't be blamed for it. I understand. Um, but for the most part, I think we were quite well behaved. I'm I'm talking um for everyone else, probably apart from me. I'm not sure about me. You know when you have your own, you know when you have your little black spots or little blind spots. That's what I've had of the evening. I've kind of have these um, I kind of have these select. I've had these flashes of memory, right, of where I was sitting down, standing up in the toilet outside. You know, I kind of have these little bursts of memory, but for the most part, there's nothing linking them. And that always has to do with alcohol, man. Alcohol is a fucking nightmare, isn't it? Um, it's it's the thing that can help you. It can help. It can limber you up, right? So it can it can relax your nerves. So if you're nervous about something, you can take have a drink, or if you're gonna meet someone for the first time, a date, or whatever it may be, right? It can it can help, right? If you've had a rough week, having that first glass of a pint can really be, it can be really satisfying, right? But then if you take it too far, you end up being uh, really sloppy, right? You end up uh, being a little bit lethargic, you end up stumbling all of, all over the place. And you get that weird itch where you kind of feel like you have to keep drinking, but you're already fucked. Then the next stage after that is where I hit probably the kind of blackout stage where you're like, you know, you're having these um, weird moments where you're kind of, not 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 self-aware and you're aware not self-aware and you're aware and then mixed into that right into that fucking cocktail i had like two anti-allergy tablets right and all sorts of other shit so i was already like you know i don't know how would you call it um i was already spinning right my head was already in another planet and then um luckily luckily somehow i found my way into an uber um uh, which got me home and i, I got home at, at a reasonable of time but I, ha I did have one casualty i lost the camera so that's the only casualty I had of the, of the whole evening. But overall, I think that was all right. Losing one camera is not too bad uh, as things go. But yeah, man, um, I feel I'm going to give it a bit of a break for the month. I think uh, for the month of July, I'm going to just uh, abstain from the uh, sugary, bubbly, alcoholic beverages and just kind of give my body a chance to recover. 
and just make it miss it again, right? Um, I've gone on long stretches of absence before, just because you know, you know when you you know when you know uh, you gotta know yourself, right? You got you gotta realize that maybe your own personality probably isn't conducive to a lot of things. So I know my personality, how you know being a highly I wouldn't say addictive, but highly I'm I'm highly into things, right? I don't I don't get into things as half measures, right? I start reading books, I start reading for a month, right? Um, I start working out, I start working out six days a week. I start on learn languages, I want to learn all the languages, right? I'm really heavy into my shit, right? So with that being said, when I go out, it's usually a heavy situation. But I'm also happy that I don't have the, um, how would you call it? I don't have an addictive personality, I think. I think I have a very, um, I think I go over the top personality, but not addictive. So I can quit cold turkey. I've had a lot of times where I've, I've been completely abs- I've been completely abstaining from anything, right? For the most part, and I've done it for long stretches of time, like six months. I think was probably my longest, and I didn't. It, it, it didn't. It didn't hurt. I was I was perfectly fine. I went to Berlin um, for Fashion Week in the month of January. I think no, was it no for Trade Show Week? I think it might have been January, right? I think so. Or Fashion Week or, or Trade Show Week during the month of January. And I went to loads of press parties where there was just an abundance of free drinks. I went to one uh, press party, which I think I might have mentioned before. It was for an Adidas LMDs, the first one that came out, the kind of ones of the France color, right? I went to a party for that in Berlin where Kano and uh, Goldie were DJing. Goldie DJ, Kano MC, like fucking crazy venue, right? Mass, amazing venue, um, fully free, comped out. They had these, they had basically a wall with Heineken uh, fridges. You just open them and take a bottle of Heineken and then the bar had mixers, uh, cocktails and shit that were completely free. And then they also had a fridge full of Red Bulls. I was just on Red Bull the whole night and I didn't, I was perfectly fine. So I know I don't have a addictive personality because if, if that was somebody else, you'd be fucking, you know what I mean? You'd be itching like, give me my fucking hit, give me my hit, give me my hit. So I don't have a addictive personality. But even with that being said, you still have to take the precautions. You know, you still have to kind of just take, um, walk backwards, you know, a little bit and be like, you know what? Let me take a deep breath and fucking relax. Um, that's the main part and plus it just takes up so much time i spent the whole of saturday lying in working the whole of sunday lying in do you know what i mean like it just took up all my weekend the time when i thought i was gonna do loads of shit i didn't end up doing it because i was just hung over so yeah man i'm gonna just take a break and take things a bit easy and go from there and and, and you know it, it goes without saying you know but um but it the pie was amazing um, like I said before, it was great to see people that weren't awkward around each other, right? Because I'm so used to being in company parties where everyone's really awkward because you don't get to talk to each other. Because that's, the, but that wasn't, but that wasn't awkward. Um, we had tacos, um, we had loads of cocktails, we had some prosecco, we had beers and these little tins everywhere. That was fucking cool. I love that detail, by the way. We had these, we had these massive uh, silver um bins i don't know silver bins or trays or dishes right on the floor fill up with ice with loads of beer and bottles of prosecco and they just like you could just pick up that was a fucking genius move um i've always been a big fan of that i think more so from a dj point of view whenever i've been played in clubs sometimes it can be annoying to go because some bars and clubs give you tokens some bars and clubs just allow you to just go to a bar and ask for a drink and they put it down as dj or whatever but I always like the idea of just like um, just giving me a kind of a little tub, right? Like a you know they put champagne and shit in, filling up with ice and just putting a few bottles in it, just to get the, just to get started. You know what I mean? Because sometimes, especially if you're in a new venue, that first ask can be a bit weird, or you know, especially if you haven't sorted it out. I don't know, it's just strange. So um, that was nice um, that they had that all sorted, and it was in a fairly local venue, so that helped out with everything. But yeah, overall, pretty good. But the lesson of the day or lesson of the weekend is you gotta take it easy, man. So yeah, I've been taking it nice and easy. Had a nice healthy weekend, working out twice a day. Working out what? Two times now. It's Tuesday now, whatever. Um, eating healthy, you know, sleeping on time and all that shit. But it's funny what parties do to you, isn't it? Like <laughs> you start to <laughs> recalibrate your whole entire life after a party. You should probably do that anyway in, in in your everyday life. But you know, sometimes you cannot help but do these kind of things. Um, what's been happening? Oh, you watching the World Cup? Um, England are going to play today. We're we're facing Col- Colombia. It's interesting to. Uh, it's interesting that regardless of what regime we have, we have in charge of England, right? Regardless of what changes are made in a squad selection, formation, all that sort of shit. The one thing that really hurts England and the one thing I think that kind of permeates through the team or in the culture <coughs> is this, um, we kind of, we get too excited, man. Like, you know, like we beat two shitty teams in our group. Then we got beaten by the first good side we faced, even though we made eight changes. And then all of a sudden... You're hearing talk of um, 
we need to it was good that we finished second because now we got we got an easier runway or towards the final it's like who the fuck thinks like that for a team who is for a team like england that's like a serial um we always come up short right we're serial losers right we always come up short we always fall um at the last hurdle or no sorry the, the second to last hurdle or whatever right we always fuck up somewhere or the other for a team such as england to kind of uh, forecast how they're gonna potentially get to the final when you haven't even got there yet right when you haven't even shown any kind of um level of performance that will strike fear in anyone else in the tournament is absurd i find it really absurd i find it crazy and i'm not sure what it is about the culture that kind of gets us thinking that way like i think what i think personally is that there's a section of people out there who kind of want us to win the uh, uh, win something regardless how, how we do it just to win it but I can't remember a team or a nation that won the Euros or the World Cup that didn't deserve it, that didn't show some sort of high level, uh, consistent high level performance. No one flukes it. It's too, it's too, the stakes are too high and the players are too good. Think about it, right? Especially in the knockout rounds, you have some of the best teams in the world left with some of their, who, who, have, their, who have their best players available selection playing. Um, week in week I mean or every other couple of days right so it's a pinnacle of sports a pin absolute pinnacle and it only comes around every four years so to suggest that somehow you could fluke it all the way there it's not really correct right it's not the right way because most teams have most nations are able to have a cycle where they, they're able to have a group of players that come around every four years that can sustain a good uh, tournament run right but maybe sometimes with the Champions League, with the FA Cup, with the Premier League, you can get lucky. Like Leicester can get lucky, not not lucky, but Leicester could win the Premier League because they could come around in a in a year where there was no other dominating force in the Premier League. Man United are going for a transition. Chelsea were changing loads of managers. Liverpool, are Liverpool, Arsenal, are Arsenal. And if you're Leicester and you put through consistent performances, you can possibly win the league, right? But I don't think you can win the league if you're Leicester every four years. If the league was unavailable every four years, because the the main the big the top teams would get their acts together within those four years. Same with the big nations, like uh, Spain got knocked out, right? But do you think they're going to come back and be worse in the next four in the next World Cup? Pro probably not. Germany didn't perform as high as they should. Do you think they're going to be worse? Probably not. Holland didn't even qualify. Italy didn't even qualify. Do you think they're going to be worse? Probably not. So this idea that we can actually f we can fluke it to the final is very very bizarre. I don't know where I don't know where that's coming from. I guess it's maybe just pure desperation, and you know the fact that the Premier League is probably one of the most watched leagues in the world, right? It generates so much money. But for some reason, the the national team is is so far behind everyone else. And just in terms of just general style of play, in terms of maybe the quality of player, um, in terms of just like, I don't know, like honours, you know, just straight up trophies. But for how big the Premier League is, it should have, we should have probably have more Euros and World Cups to our belt, right? For the most part. But um, I don't know. I don't know. It, Let's see. Let's see what happens. Um, hopefully the Columbia game goes well. Um, I'm a bit nervous because everyone in the press is talking about Columbia like they're like they're a gimme because Jamie Rodriguez isn't playing. But I've got a feeling he probably is going to play anyway. But even if he doesn't play, Columbia is still a, a very formidable side. They have a lot of very skilled and technical players. Um, they play possession-based football much better than we do. Um, they're great on a counter-attack. The only thing that they might be worried about is maybe taking their chances up front. They might not have a striker who can actually finish. Um, Falcao for all his great prowess. If you're if you're able if you're able to nullify Falcao's quote unquote pace and movement, you can probably nullify uh, Colombia overall. But if you get if you give him room to finish, and he's gonna obviously put it away. I think he's shown that a couple of times so far in the World Cup. Or no, once he scored that amazing goal with the outside of his foot, didn't he? Um, but let's see, man. I'm I'm hoping that they do a good job of it. I like this current crop of England players. I think they've take, they've gone about represent England in a very carefree way I'm not sure if that's to do with Gareth Southgate if that should just do with this generation not being that overawed with the pressure of the media and shit um I know we friend I spoke about a lot a couple of times with Stephen Gerrard and Frank Lampard that spoke about the pressure of the media they spoke about the club rivalries but I think this generation they aren't the same you know even when Barcelona and Real Madrid play a lot of them are friends you know you see them hugging at the end it's not how it used to be a few years ago where like you know uh, people were throwing pig's head on the floor because, you know, Luis Figo moved from, Real, from Barcelona to Real Madrid and people thought he was a traitor and shit. It's not that intense as it was back in the day, I think. I think I think it should, 
I think that's probably the reason why there's such a good harmony in England squad overall. But let's see. Let's see. Hopefully, hopefully it goes well. Hopefully, our lads can make up, uh, represent themselves in a good way, and we kind of get through. But I'm, I'm just, I don't know, man. I just don't buy this whole like um charting your way through to the final the easiest way i just don't think that's the right way to go about things in sport you have to beat what's in front of you and you have to beat them well and consistent consistently good performances regardless who you're facing is going to bleed into other performances too but you know maybe i'm wrong um let's see what happens but yeah um that's been it in terms of sports why laws happened during the weekend i don't know they'll probably jump into some subjects sir because i've been away haven't i all right I've been away, I've been away, been away, been away. So, number one, have you guys seen this topic? Um, have you guys seen this story it came out recently about Big Sean saying that he was depressed, right? And suffering from anxiety, which is why the, the tour got cancelled a few months ago. I'm not sure if you remember, but there was a tour scheduled, right, to go out. Um, it was Big Sean, I think, Playboy Carter. It looked really good. For the most part, if I remember what the tour was, it was like a best, it was like a, it was like a, Greatest hits, Big Sean's greatest hits. So I think he had this weird thing, right? Where oh, I'm gonna get it up on the screen actually. Maybe it'll show it here. Ba 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 ba. But I remember seeing the tour and thinking, you know what? This is a fucking great, great fucking idea, right? Um, uh, what's that? Unfriendly reminder tour. Da, da, da. Let's see here. Unfriendly reminder tours. Cool. So, the tour, if I remember it correctly, I'm going to show you on the screen now if you guys can see it. If I remember correctly, the tour, so it's called the Unfriendly Reminder Tour, as you can see here on the screen. Hopefully, you guys can see it. Um, and, and if I remember correctly, so he took Playboy Carti, Playboy Carti, sorry, Sh Shai Glizzy and, and Gashi on tour with him. So, it's going to be a proper nation, North America tour. And if I remember correctly on his Twitter, he had like this thing where you could pick the songs that you wanted to hear um, during the tour, right? The most voted songs, and they would kind of go into a little gamified thing whatever and it seemed pretty cool but i remember i remember seeing it and thinking it must be annoying to be big sean right because he's at stage of his career where most of his sets that he performs he performs a lot of his own songs but also a lot of verses that he's done other people's songs right and if you think about it critically he's probably what most well known for his verses on other people's songs right as opposed to the songs overall um i don't really hear people playing big sean um in public and shit you don't really see him he's not really a big playlist artist in that regard either but he has a skill rapping ability um and t he has probably the rapping ability only to really be up there in a, in a conversation with all the other people but the thing that he really suffers from in my opinion is that he's not able to make albums or songs that are consistently good let's say for instance like some of these albums i have like two or three songs at best on the album and they'll be spread across the album as well and another thing I, I wasn't really a big fan of was his sequencing. Like, so if he's got two or three good songs on an album out of 10, you might think that's a quite a good ratio. But if they're track one, track seven and track 10, then you have to get through a lot of shit to get to the good songs. But it, it just seemed a bit weird, right? He's always, he's been in this weird kind of situation. Plus there was that thing where um, I remember uh, Kanye saying that he didn't really like the, uh, the I think the album before last and saying that they were going to go back to drawing board. They were going to help him out on the album. And it just seemed like he was in like a weird kind of zone. Like he, I, don't, I, I didn't really, it was hard to really tell where he was kind of going with his, with his career in general. Then out of the blue, the talk got cancelled, right? And no explanation was made. And I think it was cited about some technical difficulties kind of thing, right? But then this story came out the other day that supposedly he was suffering from anxiety and depression. I fucking hate these auto videos on websites. How annoying are they, right? Like, look, I just want to read the fucking story and it's still there. It's like so annoying. Go away. Anyway, so um, then the story comes out that supposedly he's been suffering from anxiety and depression. That's the reason why he had to cancel the tour, which I thought was kind of interesting. And he kind of speaks about it a little bit here um, with his chat to Billboard, right? Um, so it basically says here that in a wide raging chat with Billboard published Friday, Sean reaffirmed his commitment to staying in the studio until his next album is as strong as possible, saying he had some things to work out in my head. I really took the time out to nurture myself, to take care of myself. It took me a lot. It took it took me a lot. It took a lot. It took me a lot of depression. A weird sentence. It took me a lot of depression and having a lot of anxiety to realize something was off. I've been getting myself together, getting my mind right, so I've been taking better care of myself. And not only am I bringing my best self to the music, but I'm, I'm bringing my best self to the table, to my city, to my fans, to the people who are, who are about me. 
Um, and I always I thought that was interesting because it it did seem to me that it was always it was always off his music. It just seemed like it just didn't connect as well as it should have, and I just didn't know why. And he has all the he has all the um, tools at his disposal, right? He was signed to a great label. He had a co-sign from Eminem. Uh, he was kind of a good music affiliate. Um, it just didn't make sense. And whenever the album came out, his sales were always really poor compared to the kind of star level of the kind of compared to his star. This he's um, he's he's a perceived star power, right? I don't want to say his actual star power because you don't know if he's actually famous for that. You don't know. You don't really know how highly well regarded he is for real, you know, because you know people can place you in certain places and they can put you next to people and they can make it seem like you're bigger than them, but maybe you're not. And it was interesting to me how poor his album sales done. And then another interesting tidbit about this story is considering how much of great resources he's had, his albums have never performed that well. Then musically, they're not recognized as classics or anything. And when then you look on the other side of the aisle, someone like Tyler, the creator, for instance, who hasn't, is not someone that's been co-signed by anyone. If you, if anyone you could say co-signed, maybe he's like a, he's like a child of Pharrell, but it wasn't a Pharrell co sign that got him introduced to the game for the most part. Um, he kind of is he came at it from left field, you know, like um, he's kind of got a very unconventional approach to rapping, came with the whole old future thing. Like he was always a kind of a, uh, you know, the kind of black sheep within the hip hop world. But he's always kind of done really good, solid numbers without having heavily featured albums, you know, with all the obvious people. Like he's a, you know, like he's an artist, he's an artist for real. And he's always outperformed um, Big Sean. I remember him saying a few times on Twitter, like throwing subs, like saying, you know, um, look how well my album's done considering like I've got no cosign. Um, I'm not signed to a big major label. I don't have Kanye's back in behind me. And then I'll, it got me thinking like maybe, maybe it's not the anxiety and depression. Maybe Big Sean just isn't as good as we think he is, right? Or he hasn't really actualized his potential, his talent overall. And I think that can fuck with your head, right? When you know lyrically right you're as good as anyone else like in the in the genre you're as good as anyone else you can you can go bar for bar with the best rapper in the, in the game right but we're at this stage of hip-hop now where it's less about rap right in general for the most part for them in the mainstream world in the spotify playlist world maybe not um in the hip-hop purist world there's still a lot of people that appreciate rap for rapping sake right in terms of the west side gun kind of people right people that can actually rap right but for the most part in the playlist generation that we're in you have to make good songs right it, you can't just rap well um kendrick is a good example of that right he raps amazingly well but he actually makes good songs so there's that and then there's the other factor of it of being able to do that thing that donald glover can do with this is america video right the the extra the extra ingredient the actually little star power thing um which not, a lot, not everyone can do right um playboy cut his album cover um his videos the, there's that little extra bit, right? Um, um, XX, XX Tentacion, God Rest the Dead, um, his whole career, basically, right? There's that extra little bit that you have to do that. I don't know what it is. If that is what you call the X Factor, if that's what you call star power, but that's the thing that Big Sean seems to be missing, right? He, he He's a good rapper. He makes okay songs. They're not the best, in my opinion, but he's just missing that little extra bit to take him over to the to take him over to the other side, to get him up that other, the other step of the ladder. And I'd, if anything, I'd kind of correlate him a little bit to kind of Wale. Wale's in the same sort of predicament where he's a very good rapper, a very good songwriter for that for the most part, can make good songs, but pers his, his own personality doesn't seem to be connecting with people. He doesn't seem to be congruent with the wider public. And, and again, I don't know what it is. I don't know if that's star power. I don't know if that sometimes you just can be an unlikable person or... You just don't connect with people. I don't know what it is, but I, I would be a bit hesitant to say something. I, I'd be a bit hesitant to, if I was Big Sean, to immediately prescribe that to the anxiety and um, depression. But then maybe depression and anxiety comes from that. It does stem from the fact that you're not as good as you think you should be, right? You don't, you don't, you're not where you should be, right? That can be very frustrating. I mean, I think I spoke to somebody at work about this, actually. Um, that, that deep... Um, understanding and knowing that you know you're better than what you are actually doing, right? But I think in life, you have to have the humility to kind of recognize that maybe where you're at is where you're at because of what you've done, right? It's not necessarily a thing of like um, people are against you or it's this depression or it's the fact that I can't do this. It's not usually it's because of you, right? But then there can be extenuating circumstances that can, you know, 
count towards it. But I think for the most part, you kind of have to get that out of the way. And then once you get that out of the way, you know, um, then maybe you can give yourself more of a reason to complain, right? In that respect, right? You kind of get your, get this goose out of the way, kind of get get yourself in order, and then maybe you can perform to highest ability. But it just, it just got me thinking a lot about, you know, being an artist on that kind of level. And that's the bit that people don't talk about a lot, right? If you're kind of trying to make it as a as an artist in that regard like sometimes it just it doesn't work out fully it works out enough where you have you know big sean doesn't have to work a normal job he's probably got his parents at home he's probably if he's got siblings they're looked after he's employed his friends and family and friends and shit um he goes to celebrity events he gets you know he gets wine and dined uh, he got he, he's got a very he's got a, a, a very well known attractive girlfriend in jenna Aiko. like you know like you've got all the obvious riches that you kind of would want before you start doing the game but then once you get in the game, or if you are a true artist, you kind of want to be recognized for your artistry. You don't just want to be famous for the sake of being famous. Or I mean, you want to be in that conversation when the best album thing comes around or the best verse or the best collaboration or, or whatever, album cover. You want to be in that conversation. And it can be disheartening to be someone like Big Sean and not have that, you know, just not have that be your thing at the moment. And maybe and also think about it, the Wyoming project with Kanye and all the seven albums, seven the seven track albums, um, not including uh Tiana Taylor's, he wasn't involved in that. Now maybe because he said in the article, you know, he's concentrating on making his album and he's locking in and he doesn't want to have any distractions and shit. So maybe he requested not to be involved, but he wasn't involved in that rollout and shit. That can be a bit disheartening maybe a little bit and maybe he could maybe complain and say he wasn't maybe given Kanye's best work to kind of ride on maybe on the back of that i don't know but i just think it's an interesting it's an interesting perspective i think for people to kind of observe like the guy that didn't make it the guy that didn't make it as far as he could right that that perspective as opposed to the you know the the 0.0.1 percent who are kind of crushing it i think you got to look at the people that kind of didn't really get there and that's where you might find some lessons to be gleaned over it but yeah hopefully he kind of gets over the whole idea it must be it, it must have took a lot of courage for him to admit it because i think a lot of people were, spe- were kind of speculating on why the tour got cancelled in the first place and then he kind of you know basically um explained why it didn't go as well as planned but you know and now look look at playboy Carty's star level he's kind of fastly fast approaching that kind of you know status of maybe even overtaking um big sure maybe maybe on relevant relevancy because you know big sure hasn't been releasing anything lately for a while but obviously um big sure has a longer track record but in terms of just like the overall package right albums it's kind of playboy cart you can argue is two for two now right even though self-titled the first one is counts as a mixtape but imagine that kind of that whole encompassing like aesthetic of like videos and music and state and crowd and performances and i mean tours it's just another kind of level of what he's kind of doing at the moment but let's see hopefully um hopefully it works out for the lad um what else to speak about oh um of course we have to speak about the virgil ablo at louis vuitton it's obviously gone now it's obviously all finished but it might be good to kind of nip it in the bud and just say how uh how well it was received it seemed from the fashion glitterati um he has it seems as if you look at from the outside in there seems to be a bit of a love hate relationship with um virgil right in terms of his, with the, his output of clothes and i've and i've kind of, i've heard it myself right um from people who know him who've said who've heard him speak and he's very aware that he's even his friends don't wear his clothes right he's very aware of the irony that he's this very influential very um um, he's at the forefront of kind of fashion and culture and art and DJing and all that sort of shit, right? But it seems as if the fashion stuff, his friends who are very popular, his friends who are um, very influential, they don't wear his things, right? So those kind of friends who are kind of, you know, those influencers kind of you don't wear your clothes, but you're being pushed into the public eye again and again and again. It seems like the outside of your little kind of cool group everyone else kind of seems to be a big fan of him or he's either him his clothing or his work ethic i don't know what it is i don't know if it's like it's a cult of personality <coughs> and it's the idea that it doesn't matter what he kind of makes just people like him or they kind of want to live their life through him or they like his kind of work ethic they want to be a bit of that i don't know what it is but for the most part it seems like the kind of dis- the the fashion press don't really like what he does right he's kind of output but it's interesting to see how 
encouraged everyone was by his output at Louis Vuitton. And I was not surprised at the critical response that he got because I was just fairly aware and I just saw the kind of fruits of the labor. I kind of just saw the quality steps. Like, for instance, like you look at someone like uh, Jerry Lorenzo at Fear of God. Um, you look at someone even at, like Kyle Eng at Brain Dead. You look at um, even Matthew Williams with Alex and even Heron Preston, right? You look at all these guys and you see from the first time, from the moment they started to the moment they got uh, investment, especially look at Heron Preston when he did Heron Preston Studios, right? He did his own thing and he was spray painting on the back of uh, Carhartt jackets and making his own hats and stuff and whatever. And he was selling that brick or that kind of security bollard, right? Look at all those things. And what you see from that moment all the way until they get investment in their runway collection, you see that for as much as for as annoying as it was that Kanye was screaming at the top of his lungs about um, this uh, big companies not backing him, him needed his Medici family to back him, right? What you see is that when you do get a in big investment, when you do get someone backing him, putting in money into your manufacturing and production, there's no uh, shadow of a doubt that the level of your clothes steps up a level, right? It, the the cleanness of it, the finish, um, even look at the Yeezy collection stuff from the moment, from the stuff that he launched first. The kind of lookbook pictures with um, Ian, Co Ian Connor in the zine where he's kind of standing with the, rip, the holes and the whatever in his jumper. From the stuff that is out now, it's a lot better. It just looks much, much better than the stuff that he put out before. And that goes to show that with backing, you can create better products. Then if you elevate it a little bit better, elevate it to another level and say you go from making runway shows, right, with uh, your, your own kind of group who kind of back you and shit. Is it called a New Guards group that back it? I think New Guards group. And then you go from that level of Virgil with Off-White and then you go to luxury fashion, right? And you go to having an atelier and you go working with a big design team with actual fashion students or very storied fashion professionals, right? People who've worked for different houses, who've been working in the industry for years and years. who are kind of background people you never hear about, right? Because they're just happy to work in the background and collect a check, right? And then you get them to help Virgil make his collection. That's where you're going to see... Uh, leaps and bounds in quality and finish because now he's definitely going to have that ability to do what Karl Lagerfeld does where he just sketches on a bit of paper, hands it to someone and then they can act, they can kind of act as his vision. But if you took Karl Lagerfeld and tried to do that um, in a quote-unquote streetwear cut and sew way, it would look a bit rough. It looked like how Jerry Lorenzo's Fear of God looked in the first time, right? It looked a bit DIY, right? Like he was making it on his own sewing machine at home and then he kind of went up to producing it, manufacturing it in LA a little bit, but it's still the runs were small. And now you see how the runs are getting a bit better and he's kind of in, um, improved his manufacturing processes. The quality of the garments are better. Like it's just a standard thing. You, just, you can just see it from what people wear and stuff looking around. So... I wasn't surprised that Virgil's stuff at Louis Vuitton will be better because he's just got a bigger platform and more resources. Simple as that. And you look, just look at the show. Look how expansive the show is compared to what he did at Off White. Um, it, maybe apart from the show he did at Petit Yomo, um, in that kind of massive courtyard. But for the most part, they were fairly lo-fi. And this was kind of insane. He had tons of celebrities walking in the, on the runway too, which I'm sure that weren't free. Um, and yeah, and he invited uh, people from a local university. Like it was just insane the level of kind of the level of showmanship that they kind of invested in it. All of it was live streamed. Um, of, of course, he did live stream with Off White, but it just goes to show like with money, um, with investment, um, with backing, with kind of expertise for the most part. Expertise is a, is a probably the main thing. You can also do a collection like this. So this was for me. I was I was happy and I was kind of proud, you know, coming from the scene and knowing some people within that same sort of circle that someone from our class, our generation was able to kind of um, do something on that kind of level. And if anything, it should just be inspiring. I think that's the. That's the good thing I think Virgil has been. Uh, that's the kind of the great influence he's been kind of on the scene overall. I think he's very aware that he's probably his clothes are not probably as good as um, they. Sh his clothes probably aren't as good as his influence is, right? Um, but I think he's also keenly aware that that doesn't really matter. And I've said it before in my blog post I've written on my blog. Uh, check it out at defaultgoon.net. That it doesn't really matter how good his clothes are. He he's he's uh, he's a conduit. He just has to prove that it can be done. I think he's mentioned it before. So I think we're going to see the level of designers coming from the scene overall. It's just going to be, it's just going to fucking go up tenfold, right? Like another level. Like for instance, like imagine uh, a Shane Gonzalez for Midnight Studios, right? He gets uh, pillared a lot because people say he copies undercover. But for someone of that age to produce in clothes at that kind of level, that's insane, right? So then imagine the kid that's coming underneath someone like a Shane Gonzalez, what they're going to do, right? So it's like, 
as as whatever you think of the clothes, just think of what this means to the kids coming up underneath him, right? The idea that you know Paris Fashion Week is one of the highest levels of performance, right? It's like the fucking the NBA of fucking performance is like the top league premier league champions league this is where all the big hits play for someone that doesn't really have a fashion background who came from a very rough um pyrex vision kind of expected to come and finally displays vision on the catwalk is insane 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 and if anything it just goes to show that you know that aesthetic that streetwear kind of that um that luxury that doesn't have to be you know bedazzlement it's not like a overly barmani or givenchy that kind of level of luxury does exist and there is a bit of a friction at the moment everyone people saying you know we want to return to tailoring and less of this infatuation with streetwear but i just think the labels that can do the tailoring and fashion thing and the streetwear thing just do everything the labels that are can are specifically tailored toward the streetwear aesthetic just do the streetwear aesthetic there's no big deal about it but you know fashion is a bit of a Fashion is a bit of a copycat movement in that respect, right? For as much as everyone, like people like Diet Prada, like to rag on people about copying, fashion by its kind of uh, very nature is a copying kind of platform, right? You kind of have to take from different eras. And there are only certain many eras that you can take from. And everyone kind of takes from it the same sort of things because everyone kind of has the same sort of eye. So um, I think the only thing you can come from an original point of view is is maybe the cultural aspects of it like yeah i'm out you actually come from the streets you know you can kind of actually um you can actually relate to those kind of products and put out your actual own vision so i think for the most part if the labels that have their own aesthetic concentrate on what they do best then everyone will be okay in the most part but i thought the collection was great um the moment at the end with virgil and kanye hugging was fucking amazing too it was great to see them kind of bury the not so obvious hatchet, right? We weren't really sure if they're friends or not friends. We weren't sure how well Kanye took the um, Virgil's appointment anyway. If your nose will kind of be bent out of shape a bit, you know, because it, it, it probably is a hard thing to swallow, you know. Kanye really did try to become a, a, a fashion designer, right? It didn't quite work out for him in a conventional sense. Then he kind of circumvented it and went uh, around kind of, you know, the long way around. And now he's kind of established himself with the whole Yeezy and um, the Yeezy, Yeezy line with uh, Adidas too. So, um, yeah, overall, I was happy to see that. And just, yeah, it was just an amazing co um, collection to see. Also great to see someone again from our class get to do it. And hopefully... Now, the next generation of designers coming up from that, from our kind of group, again, see Luton Smith walking the catwalk, great, will just elevate it to another level again. And I think we just need this aesthetic there in a runway. <clears throat> and it's less about inclusion, I think, for me. Less about uh, diversity and that sort of shit. And just more so about, like, you know, like, for the most part, if, if we're being real, the kids are only wearing the designer clothes because they see rappers wearing it, right? Rappers and athletes, right? If, if rappers and athletes are a smorgasbord of races and cultures i think it's only fair that you get those races and cultures who want to design clothes and who are good at it right are given the opportunity to design at the highest level it's only fair because i just think they're able to do it like from a real point of view i just think you know for the it's just like you know it's not an inclusion or diversity thing because i'm against that but it's like writing on a tv pro hit a t hit tv program if you're writing on a hit tv program about a black character then it might be good to get a black character to come in and give you an insight about it it's not I would I just don't think writing from it from your own perspective about what you think black people are like or Indian people or Chinese people is a good thing. Get the people in and kind of, you know, let them kind of, you know, um, exchange some ideas. But the, especially in the fashion scene, diff, our, different cultures have always had an interest in it. I think that's, that's a problem I had with the runway stuff, like with the models in the early Vetamon show. It was like, it was fairly obvious that, you know, a lot of Asian people were fucking loving Vetamon. A lot of black kids are wearing Vetamon. A lot of other cultures are wearing Vetamon. But for the most part, their catwalks were always super whitewashed, right? And then they went overboard and decided to go <clears throat> overly, you know, they went overboard with the kind of different races on the catwalk now. But it's less about just represent your customer base, you know? Like, that's it. Just That's why Supreme was always really cool. Because the kids in the store were like the kids you saw. The kids on the adverts with kind of kids you saw in the store right the kids you saw in the kind of i saw in the lookbooks and shit or the editorials and grind magazines with the kids you see in the store that's why that's why people connected to it so much like you could see yourself in each kid that was in that kind of store for the most part um and i think that's the thing that a lot of people from the streetwear scene are really doing well when they're kind of making the leap over to the fashion area they're able to take that they, they don't see color again it's just a thing of like these are just my friends and I just take from their cultures, take from their interests, take from their backgrounds and shit and I just kind of use it and I just kind of distill it and kind of funnel it through my 
my label. So then when it gets presented on the runway, everyone's like, wow, amazing. But it just it's only a representation of where it's only a representation of the friends and the community they kind of keep around them. And you know, if your community and your friends around you are fairly cool and come from the various backgrounds and some of them are working nine to five jobs, some of them are artists, some of them are assistants and shit, it's only bound. It's it's only it's only likely the US clothes are gonna be amazing. And I think sometimes the fashion houses, especially the story designers, they've only got so much of an influence to take from. You know, it's only a small amount of it's only a small pool. The friendship circle maybe is not as diverse as it could be or should be. You know, maybe it's it's an over reliance on going in the archives, an over reliance on history books, an over reliance on you know what I mean. It's not maybe as contemporary as it should be. And I think um, Virgil did a good job at kind of you know dragging uh, Louis Vuitton into contemporary fashion. And I can't wait to see the next bits and pieces from the collection. But yeah, overall, banging job, banging job. What else is on the docket? Um, Kim Jones at Dior Home. Did you guys see that? I didn't like it him personally um i thought i spoke to a friend about it i thought it kind of looked a little bit like an elevated uh apc right um i just don't like the aesthetic you know the kind of the the little bomber jackets and shit i'm not really a fan of it overall i think as a first performance it wasn't as good as it should be it kind of felt a bit dated you know with the whole cause collection thing um i think diplo dj as well provided trans hack. it felt a little bit 2002 ish you know it wasn't it was a little bit weird in that regard. Um, the one thing I did like was all the Alix's um, collaboration on the belts and stuff. I thought that was really good. Um, that was well done. You can see it on the buckle here. You can, I think, uh, Matthew Williams from Alix designed all this stuff, right? All the little buckles for Dior. So those were well done. But again, it just felt like you know, they 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 really stand out on the on the pieces. They kind of feel a bit like like slapped on, you know, like oh let's get some cool involved there. Slap on the Alix's logo. So that's the thing that I kind of wasn't that big of a fan of. This kind of um, see-through top that I think ASAP Rocky wore was re is really nice though. I think that's going to be very popular with all the um, rappers and all that malarkey. They're definitely going to love that top. That top looks fucking sick as fuck. So that was a good piece. So overall, what? I like the belt buckles and the t-shirts. But that's about it for the most part. I wasn't really a, the biggest fan of the collection overall. For, as a first run out, again, wasn't that enamored with it. But I think again it's hard to um, it's hard to pull away from chris van ash's vision of dior home so it's going to kind of look that way especially coming from yeah it's kind of hard to kind of uh, pull away from that kind of vision of that chris van ash did that dior i think maybe i, I would have been happy to see a little bit more of a streetier influence with kim in this in this collection it kind of felt it did play a bit safe with this one and again maybe because it's the first rung and you know, we came from the dizzy heights of like Virgil at Louis Vuitton. And who who would have thought that, right? Who would have thought Virgil's collection would have been the one everyone was speaking about in that group of people, right? I think everyone was kind of looking forward to kind of like shit on it and say it was shit. But it was actually really good. So maybe that's what Kim suffered from overall. But I wasn't really a big fan of the collection at all. I didn't like it one bit. Again, I just, I'm just over these kind of little bomber jacket things and anoraks and stuff like ugh, yawn, man. So yeah, it just felt a bit boring overall. A little bit dated. Um, and then the Pesta Resistance, the kind of one really wild card I thought was um, Matthew Williams Elite's. Now they're referred to as what is it? 1017 Elite's 99 SM, right? And that's uh, I think 1017 is a dress Alex lives to live in at New York or something, or whatever, or something like that. No, I think that's his birthday, right? 1017, and then uh, 9 SM is the address. So, um, this is a weird one, right? <clears throat> Because for the longest time, uh, Matt Williams from Alix was kind of saying, you know, right, I, I'm not, I don't want to show on a runway because I want to do things in a different way. Um, and then he kind of was doing these presentations with Nick Knight. So loads of really cool fashion films, loads of uh, still photography and like museums and shit. But a very, they took a very different way of presenting fashion ideas, right? Um, a very unconventional approach. And it kind of uh, skewed away from doing the whole like runway fashion shit. But and that which I liked, I'm a big fan of. Right? I thought that's fucking amazing. But then I think it seemed like with uh, Heron Preston now going away from doing showrooms and presentation and doing runway collection, with Virgil's appointment at D uh, Louis Vuitton, with Kim Jones at Dior, it seemed like Alex wanted to kind of throw his hat in the ring and just say, you know what, I'm here too, right? And um, he kind of decided to do a runway show collection, and it was very interesting to hear. That then after that announcing that, he then decided to kind of you know change the name. So. 
I think now we're going to see a leaks, the kind of main line just be, you know, graphic tees and the bags and shit. No, not gra well, graf uh, more graphically led stuff. I'm assuming so. And then 1017 Alix 9SM will kind of be the uh, the high the high end runway sort of shit. Interesting approach to take from it overall. Not sure, not sure about it, but interesting approach to take uh, on it overall. And I like the clothes. I thought the run I thought the run was a little bit sparse. I, I thought he would go for a, more of a high concept approach with it, seeing how, what the stuff that he did with um, Nick Knight and stuff. But maybe he kind of wanted the clothes to speak for themselves. But I thought overall, as a kind of wild card in terms of the menswear, uh, Paris Paris Fashion Week uh, men's, I thought Alex was kind of the the kind of standout collection. I thought from stuff that I wasn't thinking would be that amazing. Um, I thought this station was really fucking good. The the high heel boots were amazing. The styling was really spot on. I love these kind of uh, hooded hijab kind of things that uh, look similar to what a cold war do. Um, the trainers are fucking sick. Those are these Nike colors that have these weird sort of like um, ice cages on it. I think there's another pictures out there somewhere. I'll try and find them, but they kind of had these little um, braces around them that kind of look, you know like um, people that wear when they walk in the snow. So those look fucking amazing. Um, yeah, just an overall incredible collection. I thought it was really fucking well done. Like, this dress looks just so beautiful, right? Like, amazing, 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 amazing. I thought all of it was really well done. Um, again, the the boots and the shoes are fucking incredible. I love the styling. And again, another amazing dress. Those trousers are probably to die for as those boots are the boots the kind of high heel boots are made they kind of reminded me of uh rick owens collections maybe in the early 2000s you kind of had these uh really high heeled kind of, you, basically a chelsea boot but with a really ex uh, exaggerated heel so you kind of ended up looking like a bit of a matador and uh, isn't a centaur you know those kind of greek things that are sort of like half man half horse Right, so it kind of made you walk like that a little bit. It kind of reminded like a bit of a centaur, but they really they look so. That's what I like. That was like really androgynous, right? So it was just so much feminine energy with a lot of masculine energy, and it kind of really clashes together in a, one boot because they they look really rugged, but they've got this exaggerated heel on the back of them. And I thought they just looked fucking incredible. Um, again, great accessories, great little bags as per usual that they make. Um, overall, I thought it was a fucking incredible collection. I love this jacket. It looks, I don't know if it's two-tone or what material that is overall, but that's just really nice. And a bit, some Nike stuff too. I love the earring. That's a Carib, uh, a Caribina, whatever, car however you pronounce that word, Caribrina, right? Again, the boots with the high heels on them, fucking sick. I love a good high heel, man. Honestly, I'm a big fan of wearing um, an exaggerated heel. I've got these cowboy boots that I've been wanting to wear for ages that I'm probably going to wear soon. So I'm a big fan of heels in general. Um, yeah, all the... Just the styling overall is just amazing. Nicely John Ross there. Um, yeah, the boots just look really, really good. Now, again, the nice bags. Um, I love this vest with the little pockets on them too. Again, another Nike collab inside there too in that collection. Nice little double denim pieces. This is probably one of the best styling uh, bits on in the collection, I think, overall, right? The, the silver nail polish. The snakeskin boots, the jeans with the circle, or is that ring motif, the massive anorak that probably is Nike 2, the Nike thing. Just, again, amazingly well styled, right, overall. I thought that was really well done there. Um, and I love these. They remind me of uh, Carol, Christian, whatever these guys' name is, right? Um, the other boots that they kind of dipped in paint. Those fucking look sick. So I think they're the boots that they came out before, the first collection, but... I'm assuming this dipped the, the toes in paint again. Is that all it? Maybe the, there's more to it, but those look fucking incredible. Um, so yeah, another great styling, another great styling bit too with the NRX again overall. Just overall, a really fucking well done collection. The Nike, the Nike bits are going to be really popular. I think these these kind of turtleneck bits are super super cool. So it's great to see. Um, and again, I like I like this too actually. This exaggerated belt, right? That kind of like extends all over and again these accessories this massive carabiner like these hardware bits are just so fucking good man so fucking good but so interesting to see like he, he's for a long time he said he didn't want to do a runway so maybe we might see uh jerry lorenzo fear of god also um do a collection on the runway too which would be quite cool to see i think overall i think that that would be another uh good collection i think to put on the runway but he definitely did announce himself i think everyone can definitely see that he's definitely not playing any games with people this year but yeah, I thought that was another stand-up performance overall in the collection-wise. So, 
that might be a good place to end episode number 79 um checking in you know it's been a, it's been a long uh, absence a long week of non recording because you know i was highly inebriated uh, on the park bench somewhere but now my life has changed and i'm a new man a better man a more consistent man and i'll be seeing you again later in the week as per usual because you know I, when i say things i get them done uh, hopefully you have a great start uh of the week hopefully fucking england win today come on you fucking england and i can do an, an update maybe later uh on england if they do win if they do, if they lose you won't hear from me motherfuckers but yeah this has been episode number 79 of Diego Sino Zinga show for more information or for more bits and bobs for your favorite podcaster visit me at agostinozinga.com um my links to my blog dj mixes dj listings or at malarkey will be on there and all social media links if you want to send me an email you can know you can go over there too and send me an email and i will see you again later in the week thanks for tuning in peace